Well, good afternoon. It's a, a joy again to be with you. Um, I'll just uh, do a 60 second summary here. I was a pastor 15 years, went on a missions trip, was made aware uh, that almost uh, 4,000 people groups in the world, 4,000 languages are without a Bible. And God used that to call me from pastor to missionary. Uh, last summer, I had the privilege of having breakfast with a pastor whose daughter had just gone on a missions trip to South America. She was with her missions team going from people group to people group and a a man in a particular tribe noticed that she was carrying a Bible. He walked up to her and through a translator asked if what she was carrying was a Bible. She said, indeed, it is a Bible. He said this to her. He said, you know, I have a Bible and would you like to see it? She said, I would love to see your Bible. He went into his home and came back with a folded up piece of cloth, much like a handkerchief, folded up into a little square. He slowly unfolded that piece of cloth, that piece of material to reveal on the inside the ripped corner of one page of God's holy word. It had a portion of scripture on one side, it had a portion of scripture on the other side, um, but that was his Bible and, and church family this afternoon, that, that was his most prized possession. That young lady had the wonderful joy and privilege of giving him her Bible. And you can imagine the joy he had in his heart as he held that close to his chest, tears streaming down his face, he had been given the complete word of God. But someone else had joy that day, and it was that young lady that God used to give a Bible to someone that did not have one. And I share that story to communicate this truth that the Fennel family, we feel just overwhelmed with joy for the privilege to serve with Worldview Ministries, a scripture translation ministry to the unreached people groups of the world. We just wanna take a moment and just say quickly, thank you for everything. This missions conference has been a grand experience. Thank you for the accommodations, the food, the uh, privilege to be here. Uh, we've made friends and, and friends that'll last for a lifetime. We're so thankful for the privilege, Pastor, for the privilege to be here. At this time, we're gonna share a video that will, um, again, share one of our, our uh, scripture translation projects, and we'll show that at this time. Thank you. It's 6 a.m. As with every morning, the Tibetan people arrive by the hundreds to begin walking the circular pathway around the Bodha Stupa, an idol built around 500 AD, and today, one of Buddhism's most sacred sites. Under the shadow of the Stupa, they offer prayers, prostrate themselves, burn incense on makeshift altars, spin prayer wheels, and perform rituals they believe will bring them good favor. Prayer flags of every color and the brightly painted temples surrounding the stupa stand in stark contrast to the reality that this is a religion that has kept its followers in spiritual darkness century after century. This area of Bodha is home to dozens of monasteries where the second son of every Tibetan family is sent as young as eight years old to study and to devote the rest of his life to the priesthood. But in this part of the world, the same devotion to Buddhism is passed to every member of the family. So much so that for their entire life, virtually all Tibetans will perform the daily rituals and will carry a sacred string of beads with them everywhere they go. You just have this sense that the Buddhist religion encompasses all of their life here. Religion uh, is not just a part of their lives, really religion is their lives. It's an overwhelming thing to witness these people praying so sincerely and so devotedly uh, to a God that does not exist. With an average elevation of 14,000 feet and the tallest peaks in the world, the Himalayan mountain range and the Tibetan plateau are home to a population of over six million Tibetans. Once known as the country of Tibet, the Tibetan Autonomous Region of Western China still boasts the largest number of Tibetan people. But today, major settlements can be found not only in the bordering Himalayan countries of Bhutan, Nepal, and India, but in Europe and even North America. Finding and traveling to the villages scattered throughout this area can be extremely difficult 
even impossible during certain times of the year. As challenging as the terrain can be, however, the language barrier is an even bigger obstacle. Among the Tibetan people, there are dozens of different languages and dialects. Most of these have developed orally, which means that no written form of the local dialects exists. The one common thread among the Tibetan people is the classical Tibetan language. This language is not spoken among the people, but is intended for written materials only. The Tibetans have a great reverence for their written form. In fact, they've preserved it over many generations, and their oral language has developed and evolved into something totally different. And because of the scattering of Tibetans all throughout the Himalayas, it creates all these different languages and dialects that are completely different, but their written form is intact. The problem with that is a lot of people are illiterate, so they don't know how to read the written form. Educated or not, the Tibetan people today are almost entirely unreached. 99% of all Tibetans are Buddhist, and with no solid churches and very little access to the Word of God, that number is not likely to change. The vision of Worldview Ministries is to translate the scriptures for the planting of churches and the propagation of the gospel among the Tibetan people, wherever they can be found. There are between 80 and 100 dialects, languages and dialects. None of them have the whole Bible translated. A very few of them have a portion of scripture or perhaps some form of audio scripture. And our burden is to give them the printed word of God and see churches planted among them. We are right now in the process of planting a church right here in the city of Kathmandu, specifically to reach the Tibetan people. The decision to come to Christ is no small matter for a Buddhist. As with Islam, religion and culture are so finely interwoven that the decision to turn one's back on Buddhism is made at great cost. I accepted Christ when I was 13 years old, but my family thought I just did not know what I was doing. Once they realized that I was serious about following Christ and would not worship the Buddhist idols, they began to reject me. Now I am not allowed to return home, and they try to cause problems for me. It is very difficult for anyone who turns to Christ from Buddhism. Despite the inherent difficulty in making converts of the Tibetan people, the Great Commission is clear that we are to reach this needy population with the good news of the gospel, something that will be impossible without the word of God in a form that they can understand. You said, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, which giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given. So we're asking for your wisdom throughout every day of this project. We recognize that none of this can be accomplished in human wisdom, for it's the Word of God we're dealing with. I'm incredibly privileged and just a great sense of God's provision and God's guidance in this project that He's brought together this team of people to begin this Bible translation for the Tibetan people. The need for a new translation is evident. The one currently in existence was done many years ago, and the language has changed so much since that time that even most educated people cannot understand it. Other significant problems with the translation make it ineffective for presenting the gospel. The translation they've had for years uses Buddhist terminology to represent Christian ideas. Uh, unfortunately for them, all that does is present Christianity with Buddhism rearranged, and that's all they can see is the Buddhist terms. The Worldview translation effort is based at Boda in Kathmandu and is under the direction of missionary translator Justin Levine. Together with missionary Luke Knickerbocker and native Tibetans, the work has already begun with the refining of their own skills in the Tibetan language. For a foreigner to learn Tibetan is quite challenging. If they have a phonetics course, they can, they're trained to hear those different sounds. Um, you have dental sounds and retroflex sounds, whereas in English we have alveolar sounds. So you probably have no idea what I'm talking about, but uh, to describe, they have ta ta da da ta ta da da Those are all different sounds um, used in Tibetan and Nepali. And uh, you have to be able to hear those sounds and reproduce those sounds to give an accurate meaning. The language is not only unique phonetically, but grammatically as well. 
Figuring out how to carry intended meanings from one language to another is always the most difficult task in translation. But Tibetan is even more peculiar than most. The way it's structured is very difficult to bring the same ideas from English or from Greek. Uh, for instance, the Tibetan verbs. Uh, their verb system, every verb is marked either volitional or non-volitional. I chose to do it or I accidentally did it. Uh, one example of a problem with that with the scriptures is did Jesus accidentally fall asleep on the boat with the disciples or did he intend to fall asleep on the boat with the disciples? And that type of issue even has doctrinal bearings because it could be that if he meant to fall asleep, he was teaching his disciples a lesson. If he accidentally fell asleep, there may not be that, that teaching. Those kinds of challenges mean that uh, not only are we required to have expertise, training, a deep understanding of the Tibetan language, but also the translation team is required to have the leading of the Holy Spirit. This work is impossible without God's Holy Spirit leading and guiding for those kinds of challenges. With proven practices in place based on ongoing worldview translation work in Uganda and India, a thorough process of word testing, translating, checking and editing has now begun. Our hope is that through the translated Word of God in the Tibetan language that Tibetan churches will be started all throughout China, Nepal and India, wherever the Tibetans are, and that they will turn to Christ. Uh, in, in, in the history of Tibetans there really never has been a response to the Gospel and that's what we hope to see. There are many people who have come to work with the Tibetan people, but it is always temporary because they try to reach my people with very little knowledge of the language and culture. I am happy to see this ministry being so serious about reaching the Tibetan people. The long-term goal of reaching Tibetan people is obviously giving a Bible into each of the dialects that they speak. Now, our plan to do that is to translate into the written classical Tibetan that they have. And that can be read and understood by any Tibetan who is educated. Our hope is, after we translate the classical Tibetan, translating into the various dialects will be a lot easier and just kind of a modification of the classical Tibetan translation. William Cameron Townsend once made the statement, the greatest missionary is the Bible in the mother tongue. It needs no furlough and is never considered a foreigner. In the same way an American Christian is nourished by reading his English translation of the Bible rather than struggling to understand ancient Greek and Hebrew texts, the unreached, Tibetans in particular, will respond to God's word when it is in their own heart language. It means much more when it is in their language. They can understand what it is really saying. Otherwise, they do not accept it. They think it is not meant for them. I met with a man recently in a different country. As we discussed with him the possibility of translating the Bible into his language, his eyes lit up. The joy of his heart was just overflowing. And he made this statement to us, why does God allow other peoples to have his word in their language and for so long my people do not have it? It takes some time for us to think about and imagine what life would be like if we never had God's word, what our culture would be like, what our mindset would be like, what our worldview would be. Uh, and these people are living in such spiritual darkness, having never been able to read the Word of God in their own language. I believe in one way or another, every Christian should be involved in the propagation of God's Word to those who do not have it. We have the Great Commission, the command to see churches planted and believers discipled. That's not possible without the printed Word of God. What I would like to see happen is a great awareness, a revival of awareness among our churches to see the Word of God translated for unreached peoples. There's a deep conviction that there's a greater thing ahead when we can hand the Tibetan Bible to the people, see Tibetan souls saved, see Tibetan churches started, and one day see Tibetan people at the throne of God rejoicing and glorifying God because of this translation project. This morning, millions of Tibetans faithfully worship the only gods they know. Tomorrow, they will do the same. And the day after that. And the day after that. You can make the difference. Will you help us introduce them to the Savior? Please join us in reaching the Tibetan people with God's Word.
We are so glad that our schedule worked out to where we could be here with you on your 60th anniversary of their missions conference. What a blessing it has been to be here, to renew friendships. Uh, we sat last night in the pavilion until after everybody had gone home and just enjoyed uh, being with your church family. I, we pastored for 30 years, and uh, frankly, we miss uh, uh, being a part of a church family. And uh, we have uh, thoroughly enjoyed being here with you and uh, fellowshipping with you and, and being your friends. Uh, we, we love this church, we love what you're doing, but we do count you as friends and just really have enjoyed it and wanna thank you for allowing us to be a part of, uh, of your lives. And uh, Lord willing, we'll do this again sometime. I doubt we get to do it a few months down the road like we did this time, uh, but it has been very, very nice and we've thoroughly enjoyed it. Take your Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter one. Philippians chapter 1, uh, probably one of the greatest passages in the scripture in regard to uh, uh, our lives. Summing up life, Paul says, for to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. On Saturday, November 29, 2014, so just a little less or more than three years ago, South African Christian Werner Gronwald and his two teenage children, Jean-Pierre and Rhoda, were killed in Afghanistan. The attack claimed by the Taliban, and they said that it was because they believed him to be a secret Christian missionary. Werner and his wife, Hannah Lee, who, had also, who was also a medical doctor, had served the people of Afghanistan through education and development projects since 2002. Hannah Lee not only lost her family, but her home and possessions were also burned in the attack. A friend of Gronwald's wrote of the last time Werner spoke to a Christ, group of Christian co-workers. This is a quote from uh, Werner's friend. In Werner's last message to the international group of co-workers, he spoke on counting the cost of following Jesus. His words will remain in our hearts forever as he closed the session with these words, we only die once, so it might as well be for Jesus. That Radical, God-centered lifestyle is echoed in the scripture that we read here in front of us in Philippians chapter 1. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 12 through verse 20, we're going to see that Paul's life furthered the gospel. And then we're also going to see that Paul's life epitomized the gospel in verses 21 to 26. And then finally, we're going to see towards the end, verses 27 to 30, that Paul's life was becoming to the gospel. And I believe that as we watch his relationship with the gospel, we will see inspiration for our own relationship with the gospel. Number one, God, uh, Paul's life furthered the gospel. And in verse 12, we just see this simple statement, my being in prison is furthering the gospel, but I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which have happened to, unto me have fallen out rather to the furtherance of the gospel. And then we see the means by which that happens in verses 13 through 17. And in verse 14, we see that many were emboldened to preach the word because of Paul's imprisonment. He says, and many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. It's interesting that even in Philippi and many regions throughout Rome, in the early church, there was a fear that kept people from the boldness that they, deserved, they needed to have. I think it's interesting that in the early church, they rarely prayed for lost people. You don't hear them praying, Lord, please work in so-and-so's heart. They knew that God was doing that. What they prayed for was their own boldness. 
And Paul here saying that these people were emboldened to preach the word because of his imprisonment. And then in verses 15 to 16, we see that some did that out of envy, hoping to add affliction to Paul's situation. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds. And then Paul makes it very clear that he was in prison because of his defense for the gospel, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Then we want to see the result, and it was the result that I really want us to focus in on in regards to this section of Scripture. In uh, verse 18, Paul tells us that he is rejoicing that the gospel of Christ is preached, even though that preaching is adding to his misery. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. I think this is interesting. Paul is not just happy, but he is telling himself to be happy. Does, does that make sense? I mean, there are some times when things happen to me, and it, 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 the, the, the outcome of what's happening to me is not necessarily good, but the overall of what's going on is good. And I'm a little selfish, and I tend to respond to what is happening to me rather than the overall. And Paul here says, I am going to make a decision to rejoice in the midst of my trouble. And, and I would like for us to ask, so what is the source of this sacrificial spirit that we see? In verse 19, we see his confidence. He was confident in his salvation. We're going to talk about what that word means in just a minute. Obviously, he's not talking about getting to heaven. That was already secure. He says, for I know that this shall turn out to my salvation. And then he goes on to tell us that this salvation is going to be brought about through the prayers of the church at Philippi and the supply of the Holy Spirit. Again, another reminder teaching us how important it is to pray for those who are ministering the word of God on our behalf through he said i am confident that this will turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the spirit of jesus christ verse 20 he shows us his exaltation when he says that my main focus through this ordeal has been that christ is boldly manifested through my life in the world even if it means my death, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or whether it be by death. This seems like a whatever it takes statement. I don't know if you've ever prayed that way before. We had a son who was walking apart from God, and I can remember the gravity in my own heart and mind as I prayed, Lord, whatever it takes, bring him back to yourself. Those whatever it takes statements sometimes are quite, I mean, whatever means whatever. The grammar of this and the context indicates that Paul's bold magnification of Christ, no matter the cause, was his deliverance. Do you understand? He wasn't thinking, I will be delivered from prison. He was saying, what, I, what my deliverance is, what my salvation is, is the bold magnification of Christ. This focus... This sacrificial living finds its, cell, its source in this statement, which we see in Paul's life epitomizing the gospel. And in verse 21, this verse, for to me, to live as Christ, to die as gain, is Paul's summation of life. This is, this, if, if I take life and I put it all into one sentence, he says, this is the sentence for me. Number one, Paul is telling us his worldview. 
This is life from Paul's perspective. And I think it's important because every single one of us see life from a different perspective. And I would just ask you today, what does life look like from your perspective? And then this is Paul's point of view for to me, to live is Christ. Three things here. Number one, the act of living is Christ. For Paul, living is defined by Christ. You've seen people with shirts that say, football is life. You know, soccer is life. So what is life defined by you? Life defined by Paul was Christ. And then secondly, I read this in a commentary, so you, you know, you, you got to study before you can preach. And I didn't really know this word until I read it in the commentary, but boy, it sounded really cool. So I'm going to read it to you. Life is coextensive with Christ. Now, some of you are probably smarter than I am, but I had to look up that word because I didn't know what it meant. Coextensive. But it's a really, really cool word. And that's why I bring it out here. The word coextensive means extending over the same space or time, corresponding exactly in extent. So, journey to the center of Paul's life, and there you will find Jesus. Find the limits or the outer edges of Paul's life, and there you will find Jesus motivating and reigning. There was no part of Paul's life that Christ did not dominate. Life with Jesus, coextensive, totally filling out all and of the edges and all of the center of his life. And then lastly, when he says, that for to me to live is Christ means that the source of life is Christ. I don't know if you've ever thought about this or not, but every single one of us are dependent. No one in this room is an independent being. Only God is independent. When God gave us his name, Yahweh, he literally was telling us his nature. I am that I am. No one in this room is that they are. Every, every single person in here is totally dependent in order to be able to live. You and I can't even breathe without God giving us breath. We, we, have, to, we have to eat, frankly. How many of you grew your own food today? We were dependent upon the farmers who grew it. And throughout life, I mean, when we go and put gas in our gas tank, all of the various air, and we just live life so Independently, uh, we, we, we like uh, the word autonomous, ruling ourselves. But the fact is, none of us are self-dependent. Every person in here is dependent. The question mark is not, are you a person of faith? Of course you are a person of faith. You have to depend on something. The question mark is not, are you a person of faith? The question mark is, what are you placing your dependence upon? And Paul said, my source for life is Jesus. I love this verse from Colossians chapter 2. This is, in, encapsulizes my wife's uh, life verse. Set your affections on things above and not on things of earth. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God when Christ who is our life shall appear, and the verse goes on. That phrase right there, Christ is our life. Paul said it this way in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet Christ lives in me. And the fact is that Jesus Christ is our source. And when we live with Christ as source, it changes everything. Jesus, I... I I believe that one of two things are, are Jeff's source. I either live out of the energies of Jesus Christ or I live out of the energies of my flesh, me. And I can always tell who's talking, me or Jesus. I mean, you know, you know what I mean? When I hear that tone in my voice, when I, when I sense that edge of irritation, when, when, when I sense the impatience, I, 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 every single time... That's Jeff, that's not Jesus. Paul lived with Christ as his source. And then, not only do we see in the summation of life, 
uh, um, Paul's view of life, but now we're going to see Paul's view of death. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. You see, death equals eternity with Christ. I love this verse. We are confident, and I say, willing rather to be absent from the body than to be present with the Lord. This last summer, Anna and I buried her father, and it was such a blessing to be able to stand in the pulpit at his funeral and say, John Mitchell is not here. That's just the earth suit he's been wearing for several years. He's in heaven. It is not death to die because... Now, I, I don't know if you heard the statement by Billy Graham who died just the other day, and he said, one of these days you are going to hear that Billy Graham is dead. Don't you believe it because I will be more alive than I have ever been before. So, death or it equals eternity with Christ. But also for Paul, he remembered death equals the Bema seat of Christ. The Bible tells us, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone should receive what is done in his body according to what he's done, whether it be good or whether it be bad. Now, the Bema seat is a very interesting form of judgment it, it, it probably the very best uh, uh, um, analogy that we have from our modern culture would be the various places where they give the awards in the Olympics. Some of you probably just watched the Olympics. Anna and I had the privilege of going to Whistler shortly after the Olympics were there uh, several years ago. And uh, we were uh, at the bottom of the downhill, of the women's downhill ski area. And right there at the bottom of the hill, they still had set up the various places where the bronze, silver, and gold medal would receive. And I actually have a picture of Anna with two of her friends standing on top of those places where they gave out the medals. And uh, I, it, the re it's just interesting to me because we don't see that as a negative. We recognize that as a positive. That's how Paul saw death. When I, when I die, I, I get to go stand on one of those places and be rewarded for the work that I have received in my life. The Bible tells us, if any man's work abide that he's built thereon, he shall receive a reward. And then in verses 22 to 23, we see the cessation of life. And Paul has an internal conflict that he tells us about here. And he, 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 we, we see this awareness that he has, and that is that life on earth equals fruit in heaven. The phrase in your King James Bible is, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. If you read that in the New King James, you'll see it this way. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my my labor. And literally what he's saying is, I recognize that as a Christian, the longer I live, the more opportunities I have to be able to invest in reward in heaven. Jesus said in the passages that we were reading this morning in Revelation 22, three times, behold, I come quickly. And one of those three times he says, behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give to every man according to his works. Paul said, or excuse me, showing my uh, bias. The writer of Hebrews said in, uh, in uh, chapter 11, but without faith it is impossible to please him. He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I believe God wants us to be motivated by rewards in heaven. Have you ever heard someone say, that man is of such Heaven, he is so heavenly minded, he is of no earthly good. You ever heard anybody say that about somebody? You know, I've never met anyone like that. I really haven't. I've met a lot of people who were so worldly minded they weren't of any heavenly good. But I've never met of anybody who was so heavenly minded. In fact, the Bible tells us to fix our minds on him, to be thinking about what he has planned for us. And then we see Paul's struggle. He says, yet even knowing that, I could not choose to live on unless God wills it. Yet what I shall choose, I want not, or literally, I can't tell. 
for I am a strait betwixt two. Literally, I'm between a rock and a hard place. The idea is someone else is in control. And you probably heard the story of Adoniram Judson. He was the first missionary sent out from the shores of America. In 1812, he and his wife Nancy went to Burma for the very first time. For nearly four decades, he lived and eventually died in Burma. After 14 years, he had a handful of converts and had managed to write a Burmese grammar. That was it, after 14 years of work. By the way, translation work is hard work, isn't it? During that time, he had suffered a horrible imprisonment for a year and a half. His wife and his precious child had succumbed to disease and alone, he dug his own grave and lived in it for 30 days. I'd say that's depression, wouldn't you? Like Paul, he longed to see the Lord. But also like the apostle, he eventually considered his work for Christ to be infinitely more important than his own personal longings. He therefore prayed that God would allow him to live long enough to translate the entire Bible into Burmese to establish one church that had at least a hundred believers. And God granted these requests, also allowing him to compile both a Burmese to English and an English to Burmese dictionaries, which became invaluable to the Christian workers after him. I was there in the year 2000, and one of the Christians showed me their Burmese Bible, and in the front of it, it said, this Bible is in part from the translation from Adoniram Judson. Here's a man who literally, he's, this, is, this is his quote, if I had not felt certain that every trial was ordained by infinite love and mercy, I could not have survived my accumulated suffering. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And then we see Paul's real desire in ver the latter part of verse 23, having a desire to depart, or literally the word depart here is to escape, to unloose. It's, it's the word that is used to describe when you untie a boat and set it free. It's the idea of a prisoner set free from his bonds. And, and I mean, Paul, the prisoner, writing about his longing to depart. And notice his motive, to be with Christ, which is far better. This, this last uh, statement is his supreme hope which is far better, being with Christ. If, if you were to read this in an in a accurate translation, it would say something like, far more wonderfully better. I mean, it's, it's like there's superlatives written on top of each other, and Paul is just saying, look, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and that is far better. Then verses 24 to 26 shows us Paul's extension of life, and he says, look, there's a necessary delay. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful to you. It's interesting as we read the rest of this chapter. We see the mind of Christ, knowing Christ, pursuing the prize, living in harmony, right praying and thinking, confident giving. We see all of this coming from a mind of one who says, listen, I am living on for others. And then Paul's confident ministry in verse 25, and having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you uh, with you all, he was a southerner, by the way, you all, uh, for your furtherance and for joy of faith. Literally what he is saying, my staying here is going to help you. And you, Paul was not just a very confident person. Paul is the one who wrote, Christ in you, 
the hope of glory. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Paul knew that when he knew Christ intimately, he would be able to show him effectively to others, and others would be helped by his ministry. And then, by the way, that is our confidence. Our confidence. I would not stand in this pulpit preaching if I did not believe that God was going to minister to your heart through these words. That, that, I mean, that's the confidence of the preacher when he stands in the pulpit. It's not that I can handle it, but that God is doing his work and he wants to do it through me. And then in verse 26, we see Paul's other's mentality, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ, or Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. He said, literally, I, I'm not worried about me being in prison. I'm worried about you worrying about me. It's, it's just really sweet to see this. And verses 27 to 30, Paul shows us that his life was becoming to the gospel. Have you ever seen anybody uh, uh, wear a particular outfit and somebody says to them, wow, that, that outfit is very becoming on you? Do you, do you that, and that's the wording that is used here to describe us how our uh, life ought to be on the gospel, that our life is becoming to the gospel. Verse 27, we see a lifestyle worthy of the gospel. And I, I, I have here in this section... Um, eight different things that we see from this verse that shows us a life that is worthy of the gospel. Number one, the Bible tells us, only let your conversation be as becometh the gospel of Jesus Christ. That word only, manos, is talking about singular living, living with this one thing in mind. I believe you and I have to develop the art of singular living. Next, secondly, we see the art of purposeful living. Only let your conversation be. The word conversation here, obviously, the word lifestyle. And he says, let your lifestyle be uh, uh, b as becoming the gospel. This is the idea of purposely living the way you do so that the gospel has that look of beauty. It's the idea of being a member of a gospel family who brings honor to the body. You, you see what I'm saying? Uh, you, and I've seen it over and over, I heard someone give a testimony, in fact, you were giving your testimony about how you came to Christ, and he talked about being uh, visited in the hospital by a pastor, and he said, oh, I did have an aunt who uh, uh, told us about Jesus. And I, and I thought to myself, that, that is so beautiful to know that her testimony through those years was having an impact. And when someone gave the gospel, he was ready to hear the gospel because of that beauty that she bestowed on the body of Christ. She didn't do the reaping, but she did the sowing. It's so beautiful to see that. And then we see not only singular living, purposeful living, but we see worthy living. And he says, as becoming the gospel, and the world can hardly be expected to embrace a faith whose proponents so little emulated standards of holiness and failed to manifest the transformed power of the gospel. If you would like to lose all of the 20-something in your church, just start a little brouhaha. Get a little internal conflict. Get, get a business meeting where someone stands up and says, I don't like that. I, I disagree with that. Use watch. All those 20-somethings are going to head out the building, because they, they're, they're not going to stay and watch when we fight. You see, God wants us displaying a life of transformed living, in which we as the body of Christ can come to decisions together because we love each other, we want to work together, we believe God has called us together, demonstrating the power of Christ through transformed livings. I believe the greatest proof of a powerful, living God is a transformed life. And when you live your life, others will see Jesus. And then we see submissive living. Paul says that whether I come and see you or else I'm absent, I hear of your affairs. The idea is that Paul was an authority over these and that they were living under that authority and pleasing their authorities. The Bible tells us that your pastor is going to give account for every single one of you. And then it goes on to say, and you need to live in such a way that when he gives account to God for you, he can do it with joy and not with sorrow. And that's really the idea here, that part of Christian living, 
is that submissive living, each of us living together under the leadership God has given to us, and then notice the unified living, that you stand fast in one spirit. I, I don't know if you ever realized this, but church is a team sport. Now you think about this, you can have an outstanding player who is just spectacular by himself, but if he doesn't play with the team, He won't be on a winning team. And the same thing is true about us. And then notice passionate living with one mind striving together. It's the idea of living passionately, living with this as my passion. And then we see the evangelistic living for the faith of the gospel, great commission living, gospel-saturated living, living, looking for. I love the idea of a fine five list. I I propose that you do, you, you keep a fine five list going all the time because that is showing your gospel living. These are the people that I am praying that God would allow me to enter their lives and give them Jesus. And then lastly, fearfully living, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries. Did you know that we show the worth of the gospel through our fearlessness or our fear? When we allow fear to stop us, we are demonstrating how much the gospel is worth in our life. And, and may, I, I believe that we in this age have been struck with a spirit of timidity. And frankly, friends, it is not becoming to you or to the gospel. May God give us spirit fearlessness, and we show the value of the gospel through fearless living. And then lastly, we see confident view of adversity. And here's how Paul tells us to view adversity. And in nothing terrified by your adversities or your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, they're going to be judged for what they do, but to you of salvation and that of God. We were talking this morning about the fact that when God wants to do great things, Satan often fights. And this is what God wants us to do. When we're in a battle, God wants us to see the adversity and take courage because it means that God is accomplishing something and the enemy doesn't like it. I, we, you and I can take courage of that. Uh, frankly, the, very, the hardest year of our life it was the first year of starting the exchange. It was, it was a very, very difficult year, extremely lonely. Uh, we had several difficult uh, uh, assaults against us personally and the ministry uh, in terms of the evil one. And we remembered that statement that Dr. Bob Jones Sr. once said, the doors of opportunity swings on the hinges of opposition. And I want you to know something that with the Bible tells us there's a great and effectual door open unto you and there are many adversaries. Every door has adversity. Every door. If you run from adversity, you'll never go through open doors. God doesn't want us to focus on the opposition. He wants us to focus on the opportunities and to walk through those doors. And here's how He wants us to view suffering. Verse 29, For unto you is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. Listen to these words that Jesus said to us. Blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets and they that went before you. I just want you to know something, that when I hear people saying bad things about me, the first thought in my brain is not, praise the Lord. In fact, I get my feelings hurt really easily. And every time I do that, I show that I've got my mind on things here on earth and not things in heaven. Because the Bible says, rejoice, be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. So the question mark is, what is life to you? And I believe that we all need to be able to answer. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain.
It is only when we live for Christ that dying is gain. And may all of us live that way. Father, we want to thank you for the work that you have done in our lives in this 60th missions conference of this great church. And Lord, we just praise you for the work that has been done in the lives of those before us. Lord, it is such a blessing to have this first pastor still sitting here in the congregation. What a blessing, Lord. And I pray that you would help us to see that zeal in his heart that still is there and to determine that I want to live that way. I want to take up the torch. I, I, I want to carry the baton of faith now for myself. Lord, I pray that you would help us to run the race with patience. I pray that you would help us to keep our eyes on the goal of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, may we genuinely say with our lives, for to me, to live is Christ. And then, Lord, might we be able to look death straight in the face and say to die is gain. We pray these things in your precious holy name. Amen.